Yep, thanks, Candice. Hello, everybody. My name is Keith Pijanowski, and I'm an AI solutions engineer for uh, MinIO. I do uh, a lot of work uh, for MinIO on uh, AIML. Uh, specifically, I consider myself an engineer on their marketing team. And I've done a lot of research and developed a lot of content that shows how to use uh, MinIO for artificial intelligence. What I want to talk about today is how to build out a uh, data infrastructure for, for AI, AIML. And what you'll see is that storage as, is at the heart of this infrastructure. And if you do it right, you can have an infrastructure that supports all the workloads needed for uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So specifically, the, the topics I want to cover are here. Uh, I have... Um, I have roughly 40 slides and I want to cover this in 40 minutes. So, so that's a lot, but, but it can be done. Um, and I want to start off, as you can see, I want to start off with an intro by introducing the data lake house. It, it, it changes the way you think about object storage. Next, I'll get into the workloads that, that uh, you need to support if you want to do everything AI, uh, specifically that's ML ops, the traditional AI generative AI, and I will call out the distinctions between those two later in this talk. And I also want to talk about distributed training. A lot of people overlook distributed training, but I think it's important. And I'll conclude with some fun, with some fun facts uh, on statistics on GPUs and talking about the current state of GPUs uh, in the industry. So to start off with, uh, what is this thing we call a data lake house? Well, the highest level definition I can give you is that it is uh, one part data lake for your unstructured data and one part data warehouse for your structured data. Now, this may sound kind of like a marketing scheme. Well, those two things have been around for a while. Are you just putting them under one umbrella, giving that another name and calling it another product? Uh, it's, it's not a marketing scheme. So for one thing, the data warehouse that we are talking about here is special. It's based on open table formats. And I'll talk about those also in a minute, but open table formats gives your data warehouse a handful of really cool features that the industry has been waiting for. Uh, it also, an, an OTF based data warehouse also uses object storage under the hood to store all its data. So what this means is that you have one storage solution for both halves of your data lake house. And the final thing I'll say about the uh, OTF based data warehouse is that there is integration with the data lake side of the data lake house. So you can see why this is exciting to us at MinIO. Uh, it elevates object storage to not just be about your unstructured data, but it's now the underlying storage solution for your structured data as well. So let's go a little bit deeper into, uh, into open table formats and in, in the, in the um, data lake house. So uh, open table formats are, it is not a piece of software that you have to buy. They are specifications. And there are three in the industry today. There's Apache Iceberg uh, from Netflix, Apache Hootie from Uber, and uh, Delta Lake, which, uh, which was developed by Databricks. And what's interesting about these three open table formats is their pedigree. Uh, these are three companies. These three companies did not develop these specifications because they were bored and didn't have anything better to do. No, they had a big data problem that existing products could not solve. So they solved it for themselves. They open sourced these specifications and the industry took those and there's various vendors that have implemented them. And now the same benefits that they built for themselves are, are available to you. So, uh, I talked about uh, previously about some of the additional benefits you get when you have a data warehouse based on these open table formats. Uh, here's the top ones here. So for one, you get acid transactions. Now this is important for, for the you know, Hadoop world. Uh, Hadoop is you know, a big data solution that, previous, that does not have acid transactions. So if you're looking for a Hadoop replacement, this is a, this is a good, good replacement. But there's schema evolution and partition evolution. So if you worked with big data bases in the past, you know that if you're going to change your scheme or your partition, you typically have to drop your data and reload it. But well, that's not the case when you're using such a data warehouse. You can do time travel. Now that, that that's actually been around for a while. And then there's the concept of external tables, which is a way for you to 
pull in data from the data lake side of your data lake house. And finally, my favorite feature is uh, zero copy branching. And I'll talk about this also uh, in a future slide. But the idea here is that you can create copies of your data warehouse using the using the uh, open table format and and you can do experiments with it without having to you know reload your entire data warehouse so uh, i want to get a little bit deeper into i want to show you an example of what uh, an open table format based data warehouse looks like so essentially what these otfs do is uh, they are a metadata layer between your actual storage and and the uh, the SQL that that uh, that you issue against the uh, data warehouse. So what you're what what you're seeing here is the iceberg specification. Uh, it seems to be the most popular in the industry today. I'm not sure why that is. The the other two are um, I think they're of equal quality, but I will say that the iceberg spec specification is uh, conceptually easiest to understand. But what you're seeing here is the metadata layer, that is what the OTF specifies. That is that is what the OTF dictates. So that is the those are the structures you have to implement uh, if you want to be if you want to be a vendor that provides an open uh, OTF based data warehouse. Most importantly for us at MinIO, you see the the very bottom data layer that is object storage. Those are objects and that are in in MinIO just like any other object. But this metadata layer, again, dictated by the OTS specifications, groups these objects in such a way that they form structures known as tables, which we're all familiar with from the relational world. And you can issue uh, distributed SQL commands uh, against those. OK, so that uh, is essentially our, our, data, our data lake house. Now, when you remember, there's two sides of the data lake house. So when you when you build this out, uh, you you have a lot of options, right? Because the data lake and the data warehouse both use object storage. So when you're starting out, you can have just one installation of MinIO and use buckets to keep the two separated. Okay, and what I'm showing here is is how to start off cheap, so you don't need to have two separate installations of MinIO. And this is great for a proof of concept or just to to tinker around and see and, and, to, and to get a feel for a data lake house. But it's at some point, you're going to grow and you'll have different workloads on each side of your data lake house. And once you get to this point, it'd be beneficial to have two separate uh, tenants or two separate installations of MinIO so that they can scale uh, independently. So where things get interesting is when we talk about the processing layer that is on top of the storage needed for both halves of these of the of the data lake house and another very important feature of a data lake house is that storage and compute are disaggregated and what i'm showing here is two separate installations of minio one for the data warehouse and one for the data lake the processing cluster i'm showing here on top of the data lake is for machine learning but it, it could also be used for inference or anything else that needs data from the data lake or wants to process unstructured data now, the cluster that goes on top of the MinIO instance used for the data warehouse is, is known as a processing engine. And it processes, processes the SQL commands issued against the data warehouse in a distributed fashion. So this, is a, this again, is a fairly simple option. It's one that's using one compute cluster for each side of the data warehouse, or in other words, it's, it's global in nature. And everyone uses the same compute cluster depending on uh, what kind of data they need. Uh, I also call this compute that's aligned with storage. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between your storage and the cluster that you're using to get at your storage. But when you have disaggregated uh, you know, compute and storage, uh, you have options for how you align your workloads. So uh, an interesting, what's interesting is that the alignment I'm showing here is one processing engine for each type of data workload. So on the on the data lake side, I have two different uh, machine learning clusters. Uh, hypothetically, one may have GPUs for uh, generative AI, 
and the other may only have CPUs for maybe traditional AI, which, which tends to be less uh, computationally uh, intensive. But you could also have uh, processing aligned uh, on, the data, on the data warehouse side, you could have processing aligned with, um, with your, your workloads. So for example, here I have one, uh, one cluster for business intelligence, another one for data analytics, and another one for, for data science. But you're limited by your own creativity. You could have a, a process, you could have processing uh, engines aligned by departments, making you know chargebacks easier, and you, and you can do whatever you want. Now, of course, all this assumes that you have a, a storage solution that can handle the I/O needed by all of this processing, and and that's where uh, MinIO comes in. We think we uh, are an object storage solution that can handle all that I/O. Now, another dimension to all this is the is interoperability between the different open table formats and the various uh, processing engines. So if, if you follow the news in the space, you may have seen recently that Databricks, the creator of the Delta Lake open table format, bought a company known as Tabular, which was started by the creator of the Iceberg specification. Now, it, it looks like their promise is to make processing engines and uh, open table formats interoperable. And this is good news for industry. It, it hasn't happened yet, but what I hope to see is, is a day when you can pick the processing engine you want and then specify the open table format you want and then everything just works. You have, you have choices. Now, when you, uh, when, when you build on top of this data lake house that I, that I just talked about and you give it an on-ramp for all your data, you can have a complete data infrastructure that supports all your data needs, not just the AI ML workloads I'm talking about here today. Uh, what you're seeing here is the result of a couple of white papers we authored at MinIO. Okay, this also this this also shows other companies that we have partnered with and that we can interoperate with. Now, going through all these layers is is another talk that I do. I don't have to have time to do it here, but for the rest of this talk, I want to focus on uh, the AI ML workloads. Uh, at the end of at the end of this talk, I will share uh, links to those white papers that I was just re referring to. All right, so let's move on to our first uh, AI workload, which is machine learning operations. And uh, if you're if you're not familiar with uh, machine learning operations, also known as ML ops, then a quick analogy to help you understand it is that uh, machine uh, ML ops is to machine learning what DevOps is to conventional application development. And and to understand why you need why they need to be different, why, why you can't just use DevOps for machine learning or ML ops for everything. Uh, it's interesting to compare how conventional app development is different from uh, machine learning and creating an AI model. So to start off with uh, conventional application development, coding, coding is your main activity and, and your data does not change while you're coding. And when you're done, unit tests and end-to-end -end tests dictate the quality of your code and whether you uh, met the requirements that you were supposed to implement. On the other hand, machine learning in many ways is almost uh, the exact opposite. Instead of coding, experimentation is the main activity. And if any of you have, have uh, implemented a machine learning model, you know that using um, the libraries like PyTorch or TensorFlow, you really don't have to write a lot of code they've done a good job of encapsulating all the mathematics and the tensor acrobatics you need to do. So you do not have to write a lot of code. Um, so no, not a lot of coding. Experimentation is the main activity. Data changes all the time. You're going to do feature engineering uh, to get, squeeze more, better results out of your model. And, and the data may, uh, as you go from one version of a model to another, the data may also change there as well. And you use metrics to track the quality uh, of your of your machine learning model metrics while you're training as well as metrics on a test set which is data that your model has not seen while it was trained so these two things are very different that's why you, you really want ml ops if you're going to go big into into machine learning so uh like i said during the introductions i i do a, a lot of research from nio and and i offer, offer a lot of content i've covered a lot of the ml ops tools in the industry 
And what you're seeing here is kind of a superset of the features of the products I've investigated. So in my opinion, and, and this is kind of like the opinionated portion of, of my talk, uh, I think the first four are mandatory. You really want uh, support from a major player uh, because th things are changing. And as a concrete example of that, when these tools first came out, they pretty much just supported traditional AI. And then when uh, ChatGPT became popular and large language models were being open sourced, uh, a lot of these, a lot of the big players are adding new features to deal with LLMs, which are, you know, handling LLMs is slightly different than a, a smaller model. So you want a major player that's going to keep up with the industry and give you support. Uh, data lakehouse integration, that's a nice to have. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, <clears throat> but you when, you're, when you're doing ML ops, you're going to be generating unstructured data and structured data. And guess what? That's what the data lakehouse is for. I think you need it. I also think you should always have experiment tracking and you, and you should have some tool that facilitates collaboration with your colleagues. So again, top four, I consider, uh, you know, mandatory. But for uh, five through five through 10, you, you may not, you may not need these features. You should really figure out what your organization needs. So for example, some, some, uh, some tools provide a full runtime environment for you. And some tools also, some, some of these tools also give you model packaging and model serving. serving. And, and you may not need, for example, you may not need model packaging and model serving. A, a model is just a, a class that you instantiate. And if you really have a good uh, DevOps team that knows how to deploy software, you, you just may not need that. It's really not that, that hard to, to deploy a model. So what I've done is uh, I've gone through, um, you know, like I said, I've, gone, I've done a lot of work with three of what I call the the, the big players in this space, uh, ML Flow, uh, Kube Flow, and ML Run. And what I thought would be good to do is go through each one and, and maybe give it a little evaluation, show you what, what they do well and what they what they don't do. So uh, ML Flow from Databricks. Um, and and uh, what they set out to do, sometimes a good way to understand uh, these tools is to understand what their mission was when they first started. So ML Flow, what they started out to do was just be uh, the, the best at experiment tracking. And like I said before, that's one of the most important things uh, an MLOps tool can do for you. And MLflow, and MLflow does this really well. Um, if you, they have a library that makes calling, sending metrics and artifacts into the, the repository very, very easy. Uh, and, and they also have a, a RESTful API. So anywhere your code is running, you can you can talk to, to this tool, okay? Uh, and you, you can train, therefore, you can train your code locally on a large VM or in a cluster. Like I said, uh, anywhere you can run, you're going to be able to get, get to their tool. Um, they, are, they are really good at uh, collaboration. There's a central dashboard that shows you all experiments. And, and I really like their graphing capabilities. You can create whatever graph you want to compare different experiments. So if you only need uh, experiment tracking, then, then this is a tool for you. Uh, they, they didn't do much in the way of a runtime environment. They have uh, some pipeline capabilities, but, but that's not what they, they set out to do. And, and they can package and serve your, your model if you want. And, and I did, uh, you know, you'll see a, a link down here I, I, on the, at the bottom of the screen. I did do a, a whole blog series on, um, on MLflow showing how to get it set up and Docker Compose if you want to experiment with it and then how to use the experiment tracking uh, features. The uh, next one I'll, I'll share with you is, is Kubeflow from, from Google. Now, uh, what Kubeflow mission, mission their, their mission was to democratize Kubernetes for um, AI ML engineers. So fundamentally, it's a, a container orchestration engine. And th what they did is they developed a way to run a serverless function such that you can, all you have to do is worry about writing your Python code and they take care of deploying to a Kubernetes cluster and they make it easy and, and it's really nice. And these functions that can be orchestrated into a training pipeline or a data pipeline, whatever you want. And the pipeline that you'll build it, build it, be building is, is known as a directed acyclic graph and, and you specify it in code. There, there's three types of functions that you can put together to make up your workflows. 
There's what's known as hermetic functions, which are just very simple functions that don't call any outside libraries. You just throw a decorator on it and use it in your in your pipeline and it just works. They they have the flexibility for Python containers. If you have other if you have utility modules that need to go into the container, you use a Python container. Again, it's just decorators. You just and you just use it in your in your pipeline code and, and it just works. And then finally, if you have other tools that are written in non-Python, you can use uh, custom containers and loop that and pull that into your pipeline as well. Okay. They, um, you know, Kubeflow, this is your tool. If you're a big Kubernetes shop and you already have a lot of cl Kubernetes clusters around, uh, they do a really good job of, you know, like I said, providing a runtime environment for your, for your models. And I will say too, that if you are, if you're new to DevOps and, and you're maybe new to containers, this can be a little bit of a learning curve. Uh, I know that, you know, when you first start out, things are going to go wrong. If you have a DevOps experience, you've worked with containers before, you're going to be a better place for troubleshooting. But once you do come up to speed, you'll be surprised at how quickly you can just shoot off your experiments to a cluster, uh, get, get them run really quick and, and look at the, result, the results. They have a dashboard as well, shows your, your pipeline, a nice graphical of your pipeline. You can drill into each step and, and see and see what happened. The, uh, the next tool I'll tell you about is uh, ML Run uh, from Iguazio. That's an Israeli-based company that was recently acquired by McKinsey and Company. Uh, and what, they're, uh, what, they, what they set out to do was just was to remove uh, boilerplate code. So once you come up to speed on, on ML Run, you'll be surprised at how little code you have to write. Uh, they have decorators just like Kubeflow, and they have a lot of utility functions. They have a runtime environment uh, known as Nucleo for serverless functions. Uh, but but if you want if you want to, they also integrate with Kubeflow pipelines, so, so you can mix and match those those two tools. Now the uh, and again they do a little, they they do a little bit of everything. I'll also say too that if you go to their website and watch a lot of their webinar webinars, they have some really they've done. A, They've really done the deep dive in ML ops. You can learn a lot just from uh, look, listening to their webinars. Now, the one thing I want to say about all three of these tools is that under the hood, they use MinIO for the unstructured storage that's generated while you're running your experiments. So, as you're running experiments, you're, you're for example, you're going to be checkpointing your models. You will you should be versioning your training sets. And again, all these tools. Send that data to MinIO. If you look at their installation kit, you'll see that uh, they are installing uh, MinIO. Uh, and what would, uh, but um, unfortunately, all these tools have like a third party database to keep metrics. So some use Postgres, um, for, for example. And what would be nice, uh, nice to have that I'd like to see come into all three of these products in the future is to have a way to use the uh, OTF-based data warehouse for storing all the metrics. So then you have a nice, uh, you know, nice ML ops tool that's taking advantage of a data lake house that is already there. Uh, again, nice to have. I hopefully we'll see it soon, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, now I want to uh, I want to move on to talking about traditional the the different AIs. You know, I want to talk about the the doing of the AI, which I break down into traditional AI and generative AI. Um, and, and the reason I like to have these two separate conversations, one for tr traditional AI, one for generative AI, generative AI, is that they both put a very different, uh, they have, both have different requirements for your AI infrastructure. So uh, traditional AI for the most part is everything that enterprises did before chat GPT and large language models uh, burst onto the scenes. Uh, use cases involve uh, regression problems, categorization, and classification, and, and models can be trained on unstructured, or mostly trained on unstructured or structured data. So uh, generative, generative AI, on the other hand, uh, as the name suggests, generates new data, and it's, and it's trained on a uh, unstructured data and it's harder to test okay so for these reasons I, I you know I like to analyze them separately 
let's take a quick look at uh, traditional AI and what you should put in place to support it. So uh, traditional AI, it, you know, you're, it's going to be, if you're, if you're dealing with images and videos and audio, that's going to be uh, on your data lake. Okay. Uh, if your training sets, validation sets, and test sets come in file formats like Avro and Parquet, then that's those are those are structured file formats. And if you have this, you you have a, a few options. You can uh, you can load those into your OTF based data warehouse, and this way the data in these files could be beneficial to other teams doing non AI stuff like business intelligence, data analytics, or data science. And if you have your, your uh, you know, training sets, test sets, validation sets in the OTF-based data warehouse, then you can take advantage of something known as uh, zero copy branching, which I brought up earlier. So real quick, let's look at what you can do with uh, zero copy branching. Now, at the easiest, uh, and, and this feature is enabled by the metadata layer of the OTF-based data warehouse, okay? And it's, it's something that could be useful for feature engineering while you're training your models. And the way it works is something like this. You, and it's very similar to Git. If, if you've uh, used you know, GitLab or GitHub, this is gonna be very similar. But basically what you do is you, you walk up to your data warehouse and you can create a branch. And again, this is using the dirty little tricks of metadata to give you what appears to be your own copy of the data warehouse, but it's not. Then you can make changes on your branch test the new data against your models, you know, whatever you want to do. If you don't like the result, you can delete the branch and, and it goes away. But if you do like the result, you can merge the branch back into your mainstream and everybody can use, uh, you know, new features that, that you, you, de you developed. Again, it's just like Git for code. And let's say you merge something in, uh, just like Git, you can, you can also roll it back in case you, you know, screwed something up, okay? But again, if you if you put your data into the OTF based data warehouse, that then it's you know available to everybody and it's easier to use. You can query with SQL, et cetera. So uh, generative AI, if you're gonna be doing a generative AI, AI, then you can just grab an open source LLM, deploy it, and start ask, asking it questions. But if you want to get a better result, then you'll want to either fine tune the LLM, use retrieval augmented generation to enhance your prompt or, or, or both. And, and to do this, you're, you're going to need a, a document pipeline, a custom corpus, sometimes uh, known as a knowledge base and a vector database. So here, what you're seeing is a hypothetical document pipeline for creating a vector database. And the bottom line here is that you'll need uh, the data lake side of your data lake house to store the documents that you want to use for uh, retrieval augmented generation and fine tuning, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and the tricky thing here is that most organizations do not have a single repository of clean and accurate documents. Uh, documents are typically spread across the organization in various portals. So the first step is to build this top document pipeline and make sure you're only using documents that are approved for gen generative AI. You'll want to filter out documents that do not truly represent your business, or maybe they're just random musings of, of, of what could be, you know, basically fiction. Uh, some mm -hmm. things to keep in mind as you build out your custom corpus and your vector database, you're going to want to preserve the access levels of your documents. Uh, you, you are going to have to convert it to text. Uh, generative AI requires text. And some of the things you're going to do in your vector database is uh, pull apart your documents into chunks and set up, uh, set up over, you know, chunks also should overlap each other in, in the documents that they come from. These are, these are parameters that you'll have to uh, experiment with. So when you're done, you should have a custom corpus and a vector database that that holds just true and accurate uh, documents that can be used for generative AI. Now, if you're uh, if you're a little fuzzy on uh, what a vector database is, here's an example of a text-based search uh, without a vector database. 
So this is a manual uh, search. Uh, it's it's really it's a brute force uh, search. It's assuming that every uh, document that that contains one of these terms is actually talking about that topic. Okay, it's it's slow and, and it's prone to error. Uh, it it also assumes that that just because like I said, it, it assumes that just because a string of text appears in your document that that, that document is about that subject. Um, and that might not be true. So again, this is this is what a you know semantic search would look like uh, without a vector database. Now, uh, a better way to do this is, is to have all your documents uh, inside your vector database along with their vector embeddings. And embeddings represent, you know, dirty little tricks with vector math that, that allow for, you know, semantic meaning to be captured. And, and this facilitates what's known as true uh, semantic search. So here you can see I'm just issuing a query. I don't have to know the synonyms or the abbreviations of the term I'm looking for. Uh, the vector database is just going to be able to find all those documents or chunks that uh, are about artificial intelligence. Now, uh, to do uh, to do generative AI, you're going to want to put together uh, what's known as uh, the subsystems for retrieval, augment, and generation. Now, this particular slide could be uh, an entire talk on its own, but again, it shows the various subsystems of of uh, RAG, which uh, any subsystems seem to be the conventional way that organizations are, are talking about RAG in general. So you, you have your document pipeline, which uh, we previously discussed uh, along with the embedding system. There's also a, a retriever system that's responsible for querying the, um, the uh, vector database. And then there's a, a serving system. Now, in case you're a little bit unfamiliar with how RAG works, it, it goes something like this when, when a user asks a question uh, to, to an LLM. Uh, the first thing you do is you uh, embed the user's query and, and you turn it into a vector. Then you take that vector and you do a semantic search, okay, into the vector database, and you look for similar chunks of documents that are from your organization's custom corpus. So you retrieve those chunks and you put those into the prompt along with the original query and any additional instructions you may have for the, for the LLM. And then you send that prompt to the LLM and you get your answer. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking advantage of the parametric knowledge in the LLM, as well as getting the LLM, giving the LLM some information from your organization that's right on top of, uh, that, that's related to the user's query. Okay. So some benefits of this approach for generating answers are that hallucinations are, are great, greatly reduced. If you keep track of where those documents came from, you have what's known as explainability. So you could show the user the generated answer as well as some links as to, as to where the answers came from. And you can also honor document level authorization. So for example, if you know, someone at your organization, C-level executive writes something that's only meant for other C-level executives, then uh, normal employees will not be able to use those documents uh, for generated answers. And that's very important for a lot of organizations. Now, fine tuning on the other hand, uh, makes your, your open source model smarter by using your, your custom corpus to train the model a little bit more, okay? Um, now, RAG and, and fine tuning, there are two techniques to make your LLM smarter. Again, using your custom corpus but, but they are they are very different. Uh, a good analogy to understand how they're different, or a good story to understand how they're how they're different is, let's say, uh, you want to take an open source LLM and edu educate about uh, biology. Well, you can find every you can find a hundred books on biology, and train that model a little bit more on biology. Now, if you ask it a question on on biology, the answers are somewhere in the parametric uh, memory of the model. And it may may give you a good a good answer, or it may not. It will it will give you it will be able to use biological terms correctly. But where RAG is different is that it goes into think of RAG as as 
adding to the prompt and going into the book, finding the correct chapter where the answer lies and giving that chapter to the LLM. So it's right on top of, uh, of the answer. Okay. And a lot of people think that, well, like, which one should they do one or the other? A cool way to prototype, a cool way to use both of these together. And this is a good way to prototype as well that, that I hear some companies do is they'll, they'll use, um, uh, open AI's APIs for, for chat GPT, and they'll do retrieval augmented generation with uh, chat GPT. They'll, they'll use the APIs and they'll just send docu you know, their, their document chunks to chat GPT and, and they'll experiment with that till they get a result they like. Now that's going to be fairly expensive if you're sent, if your, your prompts are really big and you're, you're using uh, chat GPT a lot. So once you get a result you like, you can go find an open source LLM that's a little bit smaller, uh, fine tune it on your custom corpus to make it smarter with respect to your organization. You can probably have a model that's just as good that you can run on premise that is not as costly. Okay. So again, a little prototyping uh, story that I've that I've heard that I've heard people do quite a bit. Now, some of the uh, if if you're just doing a uh, fine tuning. There are some disadvantages that you should know about. Uh, one, ex explainability is not possible. Uh, you will need to re to refine tune periodically. It's not going to automatically have knowledge of new documents that show up in your custom corpus. Hallucinations will occur more frequently, and uh, and document security is not possible. If uh, you know a very secure document has been run through the model, then that knowledge is in the model and it's it's um, impossible to filter out at first time. Uh, but it can be a less complicated workflow and it will have um, it will have an understanding of any you know, vernacular that's specific to your industry. So let's move on to distributed training. Now, uh, what you're seeing here is just a diagram of something I wrote about. I'm not going to go through all this in detail, but again, this was a, a fun challenge I gave myself. Uh, what I what I wanted to do was use distributed training on a data set that could not fit into memory or even on the storage found on a single server. Uh, I also had a pre-processing I wanted to do, and I wanted that to be done in a distributed fashion as well. Uh, I wanted checkpoints after every epic, and I wanted metrics after every experiment and after every epic within an experiment. So um, I, and again, I, I covered all this uh, in, in a blog that you see here. And what I chose to do is I used, um, you know, obviously I used uh, MinIO. And the way this works is when you're looping through every batch of every epic, you have to make a call to MinIO. I used uh, MLflow for my uh, metrics and for checkpointing, which also uses uh, MinIO. And, and, and I got everything working. And I wanted to prove myself that distributed training was really worth the effort, and, and it is. Uh, when you run things as a simple script, maybe on your, on your Mac, or maybe even have a gaming laptop and you got a, a, a GPU, it's gonna take, it's, some, some experiments are gonna take a long time. And when you run in a cluster, as I'm showing here, things, experiments can go from hours to minutes. And a good rule of thumb, and I think every, every engineer knows this, is that the more experiments you can run, the, the better your model is going to be. So uh, this is something I did. You, you can go, you, there's a link here to my, my blog post. You can go grab my code, just swapping your model, swapping your data sets. Uh, I, I use the, incidentally, I use the Ray framework for my distributed uh, framework. And uh, once you get it running, I think you'll be surprised at how fast your, your experiments run. And one last comment here too is it really, you know, when, when you do training in this fashion and you have multiple workers making requests to storage during every batch of training, that really puts a load on your network and your storage solutions. So both really have to be fast. Now, uh, I wanna pull this slide up again real quick and talk about it. You, you, can, you also need a distributed training for generative AI. And 
all of these subsystems should be uh, distributed as well. I've I've started off looking at these subsystems. I've I wrote about a, a how to do a distributed embedding sub, subsystem. You can see the link down here. And having an, a distributed embedding subsystem that that's important because every time you change how you chunk your documents or how your chunks are overlapped, you're going to have to drop and rebuild your vector database for each one of those experiments. So this needs to happen fast. And if you can do it in a distributed fashion, you can really run these vector database experiments very quickly so that uh, you, know, you, you can get a good result for your model, for your LLM. I'll eventually be writing about the other subsystems. So uh, stay tuned, stay tuned to our, uh, to the MinIO blog if you want to want to read those posts. Uh, and final topic, I want to you know, show uh, what's going on with uh, with GPUs uh, in the industry. So uh, let's uh, let's unpack some GPU statistics. So um, what you're seeing here is the uh, is the last five GPUs that Nvidia has put onto the market. And let me first introduce the petaflop. So uh, FLOP stands for floating point operations per second. And PETA, uh, of a PETA of anything, is, is a one with uh, 15 zeros after it. So um, these are what the stats you're seeing here are for floating point 16 statistics while training models. And, and you can see we have, um, just looking at the performance column, we, we kind of have a more, kind of a Moore's law thing going on. If you look at the H100 and the H200, they're roughly three times faster than the A100, coming about roughly two years after the A100. And if you look at the, the B200, it's about 2.3 times faster than the H100. So NVIDIA is doing a, a really good job of making their GPUs faster and faster. And it's just not about the um, floating point operations. They're also increasing the memory that these that these chips have. And, and as you know, the amount of memory on a GPU dictates the batch size. So not only are these, are the B100 and B200 uh, running faster and faster, but they're also taking a bigger bite out of your uh, training set. And if you look at the memory bandwidth, all they're doing there with the, the bandwidth, just how fast uh, information could go from your memory to the GPU, uh, all they're doing is keeping up with uh, the memory. You'll see the uh, costs um, and the, the prices I'm showing here are for a single GPU. These are rough estimates. It seems like these the, the pricing changes all the time, especially for the newer chips. Uh, but these these chips are not cheap. You're, like, you're not gonna be buying one of these for your home office. Um, and, and, and furthermore, a lot of times Nvidia sells these uh, as super chips, so they'll they'll network together six of them. And, you know, so six, six, uh, six B200s, so that's almost the, the price of a house. So again, these, these are not cheap. Now, uh, what do I think about some of the other uh, GPUs or accelerators that are coming on the market to compete with NVIDIA? So for example, AMD has something known as the Instinct uh, M1325X accelerator. That's what they're calling it. And Intel has a Gaudi 2 accelerator. Those two are, in terms of performance, they're coming in about the same um, speed as the H200 and the H100. But uh, I know for a fact that the Gaudi 2 is coming in at half the cost. So do I think non-NVIDIA GPUs will, will make it in the industry? I, I do. And I think that they will compete on costs. And that's a classic, um, classic economic you know, it's it's basic economics that if a competitor has a lead on you in performance, then you compete on cost. So I, I do think they will uh, be successful. The, their story will be that they're good enough. And then hopefully eventually they they catch up with NVIDIA in terms of performance to, to give them competition and, and drive down price. So just for fun, just to really drill into what a petaflop really is. And incidentally, uh, when I gave this talk almost nine months ago. This talk was in terms of teraflops. <clears throat> I had to, when they when NVIDIA announced the Blackwell chip, the B100, B200, I had to turn it into petaflops. But this this just gives you an idea 
this one with 15 zeros behind it. You can see what the B200 can do. And again, just, just look at your look at your wristwatch and watch one second tick by. And that's how many uh, floating point operations one of those uh, one of those chips could do. So that, that's just um, kind of mind boggling, but you know, these things are fast. Now, what's really scary is not just the raw performance, but what happens when you drop one of these GPUs in your in your uh, infrastructure and expect it to just work. Now, if you haven't been keeping your network or your storage uh, up, you know, if you haven't been keeping them up to speed and latest and greatest, then your GPU is going to be way underutilized. Whenever you have, and this is a very, this is a very simplified uh, diagram of what your what ML training pipeline could look like. But what you want when you're when you're paying that much for your GPUs, you want them utilized as much as possible. And that's not going to happen if your network is slow or your storage is slow. Okay. So again, one thing to keep in mind if you're going to buy these GPUs. And, and at, at MinIO, we, we think about this all the time. Like, what can we do to help our customers uh, keep up with their GPUs should they buy them? And one thing that we have, uh, this is a new feature that we recently released, is the concept of a, of a cache. Um, so when you deploy MinIO, a lot of times there's a lot of unused memory in, in the cluster that MinIO is running on. We found a way to group that together, use it to cache frequently accessed objects, and this is going to be a way to get your, think of your training set where you're doing maybe 25, 35 epics. Well, that first epic, you'll get it right from your disk drive, but subsequent epics could potentially uh, pull that data right from, right from memory, getting the data uh, to your GPUs quicker. Of course, it assumes you have a, a network that can keep up. So again, keep, keep that in mind as well. Uh, again, I want, I'm not going to go through this, but our cache is easy to use programmatically. I, actually, you don't have to change one line of code. Once you configure it the way I just showed you, it just works. It's not like a conventional cache where you check the cache yourself. If it's not there, you go get it from wherever it is, get your data from wherever it is, and you put it in the cache for the next caller. We do all that for you. You just configure it. You use uh, MinIO the way you normally would. It just works. And just for fun, I kind of, you know, it turns out the scientific community is is a way ahead of us in terms of prefixes that denote orders of magnitude. Uh, you can see this is where we are today with GPUs, with the petaflops, the one with 15 zeros behind it. Um, my personal favorite is the Yoda flop. Uh, maybe that's because, you know, Yoda is one of my favorite Star Wars characters, but I hope someday to, to be able to give a presentation where I can talk about, you know, MinIO storing Yoda bytes and GPUs running at Yoda flops. So that's everything I want to talk to you. Um, I did, uh, you'll be able to download this deck and I do encourage it at pretty much every slide. It was a, is a summary, summary, summary of some research I did or my colleagues did and wrote in a blog post. So these are some links. If you really want a good education on this stuff and not just the summary that I gave here, read all these links. I, um, we've gone into a lot of detail to show how to use MinIO for AI. Um, here, here's some more. And if you have any problems, uh, well, this is just a quick summary of, of what we talked about here. And should you have any problems, feel free to give me a call um, and we'll help you out. And with that, I am all done. I will look for the, let's see, I'll go see if we have any questions. And looks like we have two questions, but I'm having trouble pulling them up. I don't know, Candace, could you uh, read the questions for me? I'm having trouble pulling them up. Yes. Um, so uh, for everyone that is asking about the slides, I'll just answer real quickly. We're going to put it on the website. I'll drop the link into the chat. Um, and then uh, the other question we have is, how can we monitor, govern, and evaluate the performance of generative AI models? So, uh, so how the, so how do you uh, govern AI models? So, I think the first, the you know, the the first thing you should do is whenever you're running generative AI in production, uh, you want to save off every single, you want to save every question 
and um, and every answer that the that the um, model produces. Now I, I've seen um, and the the first thing you do is just have a you know manually review those so that that's one way. But 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 the important thing is to to you know instrument your LLMs and save that data off. And, and I know a lot of people do human reviews of you know yeah, questions and answers, but some other things you can do too is there is a use of LLMs known as uh, entity recognition, which is looking for all the, which is a way to look through, look through uh, some text and pull out, you know, all the uh, entities that were referenced. Uh, some people use this technique to monitor uh, LLMs. So they'll, uh, keep, you know, they'll quickly scan through the, the answers that the LLMs pro provided, pull out all the entities that were referred to, and it can be a quick way to, to do a, a, a search to see what kind of things your LLMs are talking about to, behind your back, if you will. Okay. Any other questions? It looks like that is it. Okay. And I'll turn it back to you, Candice, to wrap up. Great. Thank you so much, Keith, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.